Welcome. Glad to gather in the Lord's house. Fourth Sunday of Advent. We can feel Christmas coming. Lori is uh, over in Missouri for Christmas. And so she's recorded the hymns. So we're going to sing uh, most of what's in the bulletin. But there'll be a few things like the uh, benediction at the end that uh, we won't have the music for. That we'll just be speaking. Uh, we're also going to flip our communion hymns. Because I've got special requests that we make sure we do sing all of the Angel Gabriel. Um, <clears throat> which is listed as our second one. And it now becomes our first communion hymn to make sure we sing that one. Um, and then uh, our first hymn, we're ready to go. We rise to sing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, number 357. Oh, 
come thou day spring from on high and cheer us by thy drawing nigh disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows foot to flight rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to Bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid thou our sad decision cease, and be thyself our king of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall. Come to the O Israel. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved of the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you me my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> my soul mag <coughs> magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My mouth derides my enemies. And I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. The barren has born seven. The Lord kills and brings to life. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. My soul magnifies the Lord. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come and help us by your might, that the sins which weigh us down may be quickly lifted up by your grace and mercy. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday in Advent is from Micah chapter 5. But you, O Bethlehem,
Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. He shall be their peace. So is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The epistle is from Hebrews chapter 10. When Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that, these, that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Grace, peace, and mercy to you from the key of David, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our text, But you, O Bethlehem of Aphra, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Well, how do you know when to begin a story? How do you know when to end a story? And maybe you've had that experience where somebody's telling you a story and they say, well, hold on, wait, wait just a second, I've got to go back further. And then they do it again. i, I got to go back even further. For you to understand what I'm talking about, you've got to go back and go back. Well, let's say we want to tell the story of World War II. Do we start with the day that lives in infamy, with Pearl Harbor? Or do we start with Germany's invasion of Poland? Or do we go back and talk about the rise of tension around China and the East and the Stimson Doctrine? Do we talk about German frustration with the Treaty of Versailles? Do we go back to Cain and Abel? Where we choose to start a story, where we choose to end a story, says something about the story that we're telling. So, for example, in 2019, the New York Times began their controversial 1619 project. See, 2019 was the 400th anniversary of the date that the first African slave was brought to America. And when the Times begins the American story with 1619 instead of 1492 or 1776, they're saying we need to take slavery as a central part of what it means to be American. The critics of the Times say, well, yeah, slavery, it was bad. It was a mistake. We fought a war over it. We stopped it. We want to move on. We want to tell a different story. But the writers of the 1619 Project say, if we'd all moved on, this wouldn't be a controversy that we tell this story, right? Now, if you're sitting there saying, Pastor, what does this have to do with our readings? This is the final week before Christmas, and you're bringing up something that everybody talks about as controversial and ratcheting political tension? Well, Micah's prophecies, our Old Testament reading, they had a little bit of political tension in them themselves. If you look carefully at that reading, if you remember, Micah prophesied the same time as Isaiah. And we've been going through some of those Isaiah prophecies as well as we look forward to Christmas because Isaiah is the one that said to Ahaz, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child and call his name Emmanuel. And Ahaz was that king who was worried that we were coming to the near the end of the line of David. Ahaz was looking around at the politics around him and he saw that the former tribes who used to be one part of the same country, those tribes that had rebelled and were Israel in the north and didn't come back down to Jerusalem in the south, that those tribes looked like they were trying to align with Assyria. And those armies were going to gather together and besiege Jerusalem. And he didn't see how he had the military might to fight them off. So think about what Ahaz is saying in that context where everybody's worried that Israel will unite with Assyria to defeat Judah. He says, a ruler will be born in lowly Bethlehem, a place so small it doesn't even get registered. Now Ahaz was born in Jerusalem. Ahaz's children were born in Jerusalem. Ahaz's father Jotham was born in Jerusalem because Jerusalem was where the palace was, where their throne was. You had to go all the way back to the family of Jesse. 
the beginning of the line of David, to David himself, to find somebody in that family that was born in Bethlehem. And Micah's saying, yeah, we're going to go back to the beginning. We've got to start all over with the house of David. The political implication is there. If a new ruler is born outside of Jerusalem, if the family of David is back in lowly Bethlehem, they're out of power. It's their enemies who are ruling in Jerusalem. The son of David we're all waiting for won't be born in a royal crib. The house of David will be on the outs. At a time when Judah worried that the tribes of the north were about to attack, Micah says, why are you worried about that? When this son of David comes, born in Bethlehem, born outside of power, he will nevertheless bring back the lost brothers of Israel. He says, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd the flock. Micah goes back to that time when Israel was united under the rule of David, and then he goes even further back to when David was just a shepherd out in the fields, nearly overlooked when the prophet came to find one of the sons of Jesse to anoint king. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from old. And if Micah had stopped there with his prophecy, we'd say, yeah, you've been talking about going back 300 centuries to David from of old. But Micah is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he adds one more explanation, not just from of old, from ancient of days. Micah foresees what's clear to us now. Jesus is the Son of God. He is David's Lord who existed before David. The Son of David is also before David. What Jesus would later come to those in Jerusalem and they would ask him all these questions to check him up. And he finally said, well, what, how could it be that the son of David is also the David's Lord? That it, the one who comes after could also be before. Well, Micah has prophesied this right here. Jesus' origin is from of old. He is without origin. He is in the beginning with God. See, John knows where we start the beginning of this story. In the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and now the Word has become flesh and dwelt among us. We see how the Lord writes. We see how the Lord fulfills prophecy. Micah just doesn't have one little detail to throw out. The geography, it'll be Bethlehem. The whole prophecy foresees the coming centuries. The throne of David would have to be vacated. And that was still some time off that it would happen. The moniker would have to be rebuilt from the ground up. And the one who fulfilled all that would simultaneously be both from ancient of days and yet also a humble shepherd, a peacemaker, and one who brings back the brothers that they were so worried were about to go to war with them. Is there anyone besides Jesus who could fulfill these prophecies of Micah? No. And thanks be to God, Jesus does fulfill them. Now step back and wonder, how many times would the scribes who would write Judah's history for other nations think it was time to call it, to say of Judah, the end? When Assyria wiped out the tribes of the north and encircled Jerusalem, there own commander boasted it's the end. You're not going to make it. But no, Ahaz's son Hezekiah was a man of faith and he prayed and God intervened and Judah was saved and the throne of David continued past that the end for several more generations. And then again when Babylon came and God had warned them, said, when Babylon comes, I will not defend you. And they were defeated and Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple knocked down. There were plenty who could say, the end. But no, instead, those who went off into captivity in Babylon, their faith grew. They went through a renaissance. Seventy years later, they came back, rebuilt Jerusalem stronger in faith than it had been before. This was the story of God's people again and again. If you only reckoned by earthly wisdom, the story looked to be over and then over again and over once more. And earthly power after earthly power, Assyria, Babylon, Macedon, Rome, stamped the end on Judah's story. And not a single one of them were right. G.K. Chesterton once said, 
It's exactly at the instant that hope ceases to be reasonable that it begins to be useful. For God's people never needed to hope past belief. There were things that you'd sit and say, I don't know how you reason this out. But the word had told them ahead of time how it would go. They had prophecies to prepare the way. They would lose their political power, yes. But in that loss, find that the Prince of Peace had come with a kingdom no earthly power could quench. Now, how many of these other stories that we heard this morning could be written off as over? What about Elizabeth and Zechariah? For years they had been barren. Their childbearing years passed. They were in their advanced ages. It was over. And then it wasn't. The baby John began to move in Elizabeth's womb. What about Jewish prophecies? For four centuries before John, no one had been given the spirit to prophesy in Israel. And they had many things that happened in those years. And they said, where is God to tell us what to do? And no prophet came. And clearly the Jewish authorities thought they could have closed the book of prophecy and say it's over. We're the ones who get to interpret it now. They thought they had put a lid on God's revelation. It was not over. It was over and it wasn't over. Of course, quenching prophecy need not only come by declaring an end. How many would say rather, I know it can't have come before. How many would look at John in the womb and say, he can't yet prophesy. He can't yet believe. He can't yet be recognized as being in the image of God. How many would say his life had not yet begun when the first prophecy in over 400 years leapt for joy? Perhaps we human beings ought not give ourselves the power to say we have the perspective over history to tell when a story really begins and when it really ends. Or if not just in history, over one another's lives. Perhaps we ought to fear to stand in hubris and say we can rewrite when a human life ought to begin or end. None of us are the creator. None are able to go back to the beginning or able to write one more chapter after everyone else has said the end. But when Jesus was born, he who was in the beginning creating all things, now coming to reconcile all things and restore all things, everyone kept trying to put the end on his life from the very beginning. Herod sent his butchers to Bethlehem, chasing the infant Christ out to Egypt. And then when he comes back and he begins his ministry, the first thing the devil tempts him to jump off of the temple. And Jesus said, I will not put the Lord to the test. After Jesus' first sermon in Nazareth, in Luke chapter 4, it says they took him to a cliff to stone him. His own fellow, the people he grew up among. But it was not yet his time. He knew the time would come when he would have to let the world try to unite Jew and Gentile together, those in palaces and the mob below together, all yelling, crucify. They tried to make his end as humiliating and miserable as possible on the cross. But instead, Jesus made an end to endings. He swallowed up death. He opened up eternal life. He rose from the dead only three days after they said, the end. After they mocked him and said, physician, heal thyself. Not quite. He who was in the beginning was making a new beginning, not just for himself, but for us all. The cross was no ending. The cross is the beginning of new life. The stump of Jesse has a branch come forth with life and righteousness for us all. Brothers and sisters, I know there's a lot in life that we don't have control over. And so there's a kind of feeble power that we feel when we say, enough, I'm out. We think when we quit the job, when we walk out on friends or family, when we give up on somebody, I say, ah, I've had the final word. Game over. The end. The fat lady is sung. Splitsville. Sayonara. 
as if we've got any authority to say those things and make them so. We aren't the word in the beginning. It's not by our word the beginning or the end is written. We have no authority to make it so. Neither does anyone else who would try and say it to you. Though they take our lives here and now, we're going to rise again, brothers and sisters. It is the word that was in the beginning that has the final cut on your life. It is Christ the Lord who says, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to Bethlehem, too lowly to be accounted for. Let's start over in that humility. And let's make all things new. Amen and amen. Come, Lord Jesus, our Savior and our life. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat> for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, mighty God, there's none like you in holiness, constancy, and might. Yet you exercise your power for the salvation of sinners. As we draw near to the celebration of Jesus' birth, fill our hearts with gratitude that your Son humbled himself and became flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, mighty God, Bethlehem was too small to be among the clans of Judah, yet from it came forth the King of Kings. Remember the gatherings of your people where numbers are small and resources are scarce. We pray especially for our sister congregation Epiphany in New Salisbury. Provide for our needs and remind us that the Lord of Lords dwells among us <coughs> in his means of grace. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, mighty God, you make poor and you make rich. Receive our thanks for your gifts of daily bread. Give us contentment with what you provide. <coughs> Preserve us from coveting what you do not give and grant that we would be wise stewards of your blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you sent your son to shepherd his flock <clears throat> in strength and to be great to the ends of the earth. Grant wisdom to our leaders <coughs> and peace among the nations that we may dwell secure. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O Lord, mighty God, you helped your servant Israel and your mercy endures forever. Look upon those brought low by illness, injury, grief, or other affliction. Have mercy upon them, grant them healing and strength, and maintain them in the certain hope of your faithfulness to them for Jesus' sake. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, mighty God, you have sanctified us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ once for all. Prepare the hearts of all who commune this day with penitence and trust in your promises. And so make us holy with your son's body and blood. Lord, in your mercy. 
O Lord, mighty God, you have done great things for us, most of all delivering us from death to life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mercifully hear our prayers and answer them according to your will, for the sake of your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you.
take a drink. The blood of Jesus given to shed for you so in the name of May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve us steadfast in true faith and the life of the last.
group that I think uh, we'll pick up in uh, the new year with another um, basics of the Bible, Lutheranism 101, uh, going through how we read the Bible and how we understand our faith. Um, we've already got one volunteer to help with babysitting. We have a potential need for babysitting during that class. We're still gathering that group, and once we've gathered those who want to take that class, we will uh, figure out the time to go over there. It seems likely that it's Saturday at some point is the time that it would be. Uh, so if you're interested in that class and or you're interested in helping babysit, uh, let me know. We still got three more weeks left to go on the class that, uh, that uh, this, we've got one that's starting out of 10 weeks in already. Once we finish that one, we're going to get going with another. In fact, we may not wait until we finish that one to make it get started. Um, other announcements people want to bring to our attention? Kathy? Um, I am a welcome to the Alcorn support for the Loving Voice Pregnancy Center. Thank you all so very much. I was looking at it on Thursday and in the camera and I know there's a lot of cold work that I do at this time of year, but to see that it's just a good part of this population. So thank you so much. Kathy says thank you on behalf of the Loving Choice and all that we've gathered there. We have had a number of gatherings. We give thanks for the uh, reverse advent calendar that Nancy Kovacs has done over there. I talked to Nancy. Um, she uh, said that uh, Kovacs has seemed to have come through with only minor symptoms. Uh, still kind of wheeling out the days of their uh, quarantine, but they are doing okay. Uh, Corey also wanted to let everybody know she had things go well. She's doing well. She's at home and, and feeling okay given the, with the significant operation. Um, so we, uh, we also got an update this week from Pastor Woods, who's up at Grace in New Albany. Pastor Woods had a lot of experience with long-term rebuilding for the, I uh, believe it's Henryville, Indiana, that had the tornado about 10 years ago. Um, and he kind of watched which organizations came and fundraised and left, and which organizations stayed uh, until the end. Uh, he speaks very highly of Lutheran Church charities, and they go in, they assess, they figure out who's going to need what, and keep tabs on who's getting what, and how to keep track of each of those people. Um, and he said, look, keep some of your powder dry. We've already sent off one uh, batch of goods that we collected through Isaac's troop. We give thanks to Isaac's uh, staff troop for doing that. Did you want to say something about yeah, that? Yeah, I would like to thank everyone who uh, donated to help us gather those supplies. Thanks to everyone who donated. Thank you, Isaac, for helping facilitate that, and we give thanks for your troop working on that. Uh, but he said, keep some of your powder dry, because it's going to be a long process of rebuilding, uh, especially uh, especially with just how much devastation there was. Uh, it's going to be a long process. And so if you uh, need to re-up your, uh, your chainsaw certification, things along those lines, get prepared that in January they're going to hope to be able to send the team down, but even that won't be the end of it, there'll be ongoing work to do, so stay, uh, stay tuned. Other announcements people want to bring to our attention? Patrick? Two things, one I want to share. Uh, Veterans from Kentucky sent six truck loans of supplies down to Dawson uh, Springs and uh, Tons of water along the out there. Uh, the other thing, <laughs> tomorrow is a very special day for me. My father was shot down. He was a 17 pilot. He was shot down in December 20, 1943 over Germany. And he lost one of his crew members and the remaining five enlisted men and himself and his three officers.
Other announcements people want to bring to our attention? Uh, Rita. We, we hear a lot about Mayfield and Austin Springs and Bowling Green for uh, damage from those three large accounts from the tornado. There is one that very rarely gets mentioned, and it's down in Ohio County, in the area where I grew up. It's called Green, and they have a lot of damage too. So don't forget to to ask for prayers for people in Green in Ohio County. Yeah, but Lutheran Church Charities, they have this map that just shows this scar on the land uh, where it went and how long it was down. Uh, names each each place that it went through. And, um, yeah, so appreciate everybody's prayers. Appreciate everybody already uh, stepping up to give once and being ready to, to, to watch for what we can do over the long haul. Other announcements? Marilyn and Mark are going to have a, a Sunday school listening meeting, I think. Uh, they've got some ideas of what we're going to be able to do for Sunday school in 2022. They want to hear from other people. And then I think we're going to, after she promised that, we're going to take too long. And so we're going to piggyback on that a little discussion about National Youth Gathering and uh, youth and what they're going to be able to do for that. So anybody who's interested, Mark, Marilyn, where are you going to gather for that? The kitchen? Or? The kitchen? Yes. So Marilyn will be in the kitchen. You guys can head in there for that. Um, I wanted to uh, briefly say we now last week that the call has been extended from Bay in Alabama, and that we were going to be considering that call. But I wanted to remind everybody that we thought it was appropriate because we get close to the middle of the week and Christmas is on. We're going to try to put that aside as best we can. We're going to be able to stay focused on Christmas, celebrate with our church family. Uh, so I do want to hear feedback from people about how they feel things are and what we but not, not in a few days. <laughs> so if you really got something on your mind, I'm still open to hear stuff for the, for the next you know, 24, 48 hours. But then we're just going to set it aside, we're going to celebrate Christmas together, and we'll pick that back up once we get past the 26. So uh, our services for Christmas include our 7 p.m. Christmas Eve, uh, candlelight, service of carol, and uh, reading. And then Christmas morning at 10 a.m., we have a meeting together. And then the Feast of St. Stephen uh, on uh, the 26th. So we get to celebrate the, the good King Wenceslas on the 26th. I was going to say the hymn. Yeah. Yep. So God's blessings on your Christmas celebrations.